So let's look at our agenda, if we could, Michael. We're going to talk about NISMO and FIVO and what they are. Uh, we're going to proceed from there to talk about semantics and FIVO, and then our process of building FIVO for loans, um, including our objectives and our approach and the use case that we're working on uh, today. Um, we'll then uh, conclude with our lessons learned. Let's get in the next slide. So MISMO, what is it? So MISMO, the actual word, stands for Mortgage Industry Standards Maintenance Organization. It is a term that describes the organization as well as the standard that the organization produces. Um, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the Mortgage Bankers Association. Uh, but today we're going to talk about, you know, what specifically does it do and how is that different than FIBO? So, MISMO is a mortgage industry data standard that is used uh, to exchange data between business partners. Um, usually when there is a mortgage-related uh, transaction to be had, whether it be loan acquisition, a request for a credit report, uh, for mortgage insurance, for underwriting, these are all transactions that uh, MISMO can support. Um, where you have a, a request coming from one a business party and being sent to the to another uh, who would, in response, uh, provide output or a response. Um, it's based on XML schema, and the structure of it is based on traditional data modeling concepts. Uh, the messages are structured explicitly, uh, meaning they contain just the information that's necessary and has been agreed upon between the two business partners uh, to conduct the transaction with that hand. Um, and so usually interfaces and services are, are designed to expressly uh, support those messages and those transactions and their responses. Uh, the actual model content uh, for MISMO reflects the needs of the industry that has created the standard, um, which is a uh, domestic United States uh, mortgage industry. Um, and it focuses on all the things that need to happen behind the scenes to make the mortgage industry work. So if we go over to FIBO then, on the next slide, we have the Financial Industry Business Ontology, FIBO, um, it is managed by uh, the Enterprise Data Management Council, or EDM Council. Um, it's got a sort of different scope. Um, it's, it's a standard set of financial concepts and terms with definitions. It's based on RDFOWL, uh, semantic technology. It's not, uh, the structure is not based on traditional data modeling concepts, but on triples that are used to make assertions. And we'll look a little bit more in a more detailed way at that uh, in a couple of slides. The data content uh, for what FIBO is used for is typically expressed in web pages, published ontologies, or other content on the web. Um, generally, not uh, transactions that are for uh, or between uh, specific parties uh, for a, for a specific type of business function. Um, the model reflects information, uh, business concepts, financial concepts, used by industry partners across the financial industry internationally as well as in the United States. So uh, going to the next slide, we have a, a few graphics um, to kind of really put this into perspective, the differences between the two standards. Um, MISMO um, is uh, based on the mortgage industry. It's focused on the U.S domestic uh, market, uh, it's expressly data needed for transactions, and then you usually have a defined sender and receiver. Uh, the MISMO organization has been in, in place for around 20 years, so a, a pretty long time, um, has a, a very mature uh, process and infrastructure for creating the standard and has iterated several um, series of versions uh, prior to the one that it's working on now, which would be version 3.4.1 or 3.5, depending upon uh, what needs to go into the next version. 
FIBO, uh, on the other hand, is focused on the wider financial industry, certainly international in scope. We have participants um, in several nations. Um, it reflects all financial market concepts. So today we're going to look at loans, but certainly there are other areas of FIBO, as you've probably learned today, that reflect uh, different domains and different areas uh, in the financial industry. And uh, FIBO is used to interpret disparate information or to harmonize data, as like we uh, like to say sometimes. Uh, so you can really see that uh, from a scope perspective, you're looking at uh, one that is more vertical, uh, focusing on mortgage industry specifically in the U.S., and then FIBO being more broad, all of finance, and then also not a domestic uh, concern. So moving to the next slide, you'll see um, we've done the same thing with some technology differences. MISMO is XML schema based versus FIBO being RDF OWL based. Uh, MISMO is used to create structured messages where FIBO is used to interpret an unstructured data as well as structured data. Um, MISMO, generally speaking, you're using to transmit a transaction between two business parties where FIBO, it really is focused on uh, conducting reasoning and generating insights uh, on groups of data. So uh, sort of in a, a nutshell for the next slide, Michael, um, when you're looking at a requesting a service from a specific party or submitting data to a specific party, a tr you're looking to transmit a transaction detail or a detailed request for some type of service, you're probably looking uh, at a MISMO-like structure if you're in the mortgage industry and uh, looking to use a standard. If you're looking at uh, something more broad, maybe you want to integrate uh, your enterprise data across several different domains of financial instruments, um, you would be looking at FIBO. Uh, if you want to uh, stress machine inference, for integration of multiple data sources, then you're probably looking at FIBO as a, a go-to standard uh, for your purposes. Thank you, Lynn. Um, okay, so as Lynn pointed out, there's some important differences between MISMO, which is an XML standard, and FIBO. And FIBO really is about semantics and meaning. So, you know, look at the lower left picture. We have, uh, you know, the estimate, the when they were established, how high and the number of feet population, you add up all those numbers and you get a number. But what does that mean? Okay. What does commitment mean? Well, you got to do what you got to do. But is that good enough for legal contracts and databases, et cetera? Um, and so as Lynn pointed out, XML is, is, is about structure. It uses a standard which was quite revolutionary at the time. It used to be you look at data in fields and a human couldn't look at it and understand it. And XML changed all that. You can look at the data fields, and they have names that humans can understand. Uh, but the machines can't understand the meaning. So the meaning in an XML data schema is, resides in the names of the words, and the human has to figure, out, figure that out. Whereas FIBO takes it to the next step and says, let's represent some of that meaning in ways that we can do machine-level processing um, to add value. So, we're going to now look at this notion of a triple and see how this actually shakes out and how the semantics works and how the ontology works. We've been talking about FIBO, but what does this ontology really look like? We'll just get a little bit of a close-up view. So these are triples, all right? So we have, let's see, I can't actually see, I can't, never, never mind, I can't point, but that's okay. Um, so we have triples, say, lower left to the, to the upper middle, there's a, a data item, right, which means that the town and country is a borrower from the Fed. So there's some loan contract where the Fed is loaning money to this town and country bank, right? That town and country bank exists in a national registry. So, so we have the ontology is the metadata. So this is a loan contract. This characterizes a class or an entity in an ER diagram. And then we say, well, these are two examples of loan contracts, okay? Um, and then the other part of this, the key aspect of a loan contract, is the parties. So that in the loan, there's borrower and lender, those are the two main parties. So we have something called independent party, and it could be a person or an organization, okay? So this is a quick little snapshot of what this would look like 
under the covers, okay, so you have the schema and the data, and it turns out they're all in the same underlying representation. It's all triples, okay? And here we, we describe at the meta level how a loan contract is connected to these parties, right? So it necessarily has a borrower and it necessarily has a lender, okay? And at those point to these things must be independent parties. So this is an example of some actual OWL and some actual triples that's in a graphical visualization syntax, okay? Now what's really important is while it's true that this ontology layer is a conceptual model, it describes the meaning, we don't have to have multiple layers, conceptual, logical, physical. We can actually use the conceptual model directly to create our triples against it. So this is an important thing that you have the option to take advantage of. If you're a, a bank or any kind of institution, the triples can come from anywhere. It could come from a different database. And because you have globally unique URIs, you can actually do that and snap things together. Whereas typically in a, in a major organization, it's hard enough to, to share data amongst you know, your next group, and the next database, because you don't have the technology to achieve that global sharing of both data and metadata. Okay, so triples are the common denominator. So they can come from a variety of places. You could take XML and extract out triples. You could take relational databases. There's tools out there which automatically extract out triples from relational databases, and you can even do it virtually. You don't have to move the data no ETL, you can just kind of create a virtual triple store out of that data. Um, you can extract directly from web documents. There's lots of natural language technology. You can pull out triples automatically. And of course, there's lots and lots of um, available information on social media. So let's look at, expand out this example a little bit more. So here's the loan contract. And these are actual triples. This is actual data that you would have in your triple store. Okay, these are obviously made up. Um, so we have the borrower and the lender, right? Um, and then it, for a mortgage loan contract, this is a specific type of loan, there's a security agreement, which is for the collateral, okay? So there's the actual collateral, which is gonna be some real estate, um, and real estate has some value, and there's an appraisal that's an estimate of that value. So you have all these key pieces that are part of um, a loan contract. Over to you, Lynn, to explain this XML schema. Yeah, so um, the, the things that you're seeing here on the screen are, are two views of uh, essentially the same thing. In the right hand, uh, lower right hand corner, you see a conceptual picture of deal. So the NUSMA model is uh, structured such that it uses containment as a concept uh, to establish relationships as well as X-Link, which is a way of making uh, explicit relationships between uh, the various uh, containers that were, are within the model. So in the box that you see, uh, you can see that we have um, an instance here of, uh, of loan and that it in includes um, collateral uh, as well as uh, other information like parties uh, and other um, uh, loan level information. If you look over at the XML uh, side of things, what you're seeing here in the middle of the slide is a snapshot from uh, XML Spy, which is an XML editor. Uh, I guess Protege would probably be a similar um, or a parallel uh, tool from a, an OWL perspective. But here you can see that uh, we have explicitly described um, data. Um, we have what we call the deal, which is sort of a transactional level container, and that we have uh, multiple instances of loan at the bottom uh, that refer to loans at a specific snapshot in time, so that you can have a sense of uh, temporal or event-driven type of, uh, you know, perspective on the data. And then uh, we have an entire structure that, that that looks at collateral and understands that uh, you might have a collateral a subject property that is um, tethering uh, or securing the loan, the mortgage, and that you also may have a need to describe other types of properties or collateral that isn't real property, such as um, personal property, 
in, uh, in addition to real property in a deal, and so we have um, the ability to do that. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that um, this is an XML snippet uh, that reflects the same concepts that Michael just talked about. So you have deal at the top, um, and it's holding containers related to the collateral. Um, so subject property is a type of collateral, and we know that the actual property that we have listed here in the yellow uh, address line text is the subject property and is being used as collateral for the loan because it is expressly contained within the transaction uh, deal. We are able to connect uh, property information such as uh, the estimated value amount uh, separate from the actual appraised value amount because we have uh, expressed data points that, ex that explicitly state that that's what they are. And so uh, when people look at a NISMO XML schema or a message, they know that it's very an expressive language and that all of the tagging is uh, human readable. Um, however, what that does is it makes it very sort of verbose in its uh, definition of concepts. Uh, usually you're, you're describing some basic concept, but also then uh, clarifying and, and adding additional information to it to build up to the business concept that you might uh, be looking for. So if you work back down uh, this XML message, you'll see that um, we close the collateral uh, container um, and that then there are information about the loan. Uh, we have added some identifiers here to be able to say that loan MC123, um, which was the same loan that Michael just referred to in his example, uh, we know that this is, uh, is related to the underlying collateral, we know, uh, you know the actual number of the loan, and we know that this is uh, expressly, uh, based on the way the message is, is, is structured, uh, so we don't need to infer that this is a mortgage or that uh, it has collateral because we expressly uh, can see that that is so. So, Thank you, uh, and this is something that you would want uh, if you're transmitting data between business partners about a specific transaction. Uh, you don't want to infer detail uh, for this type of use case, right? You want to be able to say what exactly it is you're requesting. You want to be very exact about the characteristics that you're providing for pricing, let's say, or for risk assessment, uh, as another example. And so, this uh, structure works very well for um, a lot of the loan origination and processing uh, applications that are the foundation of the mortgage industry in the U.S. Thank you, Lynn. So, Michael is going to go and talk about formal logic and inference. Right. We're running a little bit short on time, so I'll run through this a bit quickly. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. What does it mean to be formal logic? And that's kind of the underpinning of the semantic representations. Essentially, you represent a meaning um, in a way that specifies what's in people's heads, okay? And, and what you can do then is increase the reliability um, of the information, you can, and you can compute things automatically. Um, so that's what inference is about, uh, drawing conclusions from information that's already in your database. And it's used in a number of ways. Very importantly, it can detect you know, subtle inconsistencies. In XML, Schema will do kind of data integrity and format checking, but it can't detect kind of subtle chains of inference that detect problems that you otherwise wouldn't exist. So it goes beyond XML validation capabilities. Um, another thing you can do is you can do automatic categorization. So you don't have to come out and say it's a mortgage. You could say it's a loan contract. You can say it's collateralized and it uses real estate, and then the system knows it's a mortgage. So this is a way to um, also add a bit of value. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, the process of building FIBO, and then we're going to go into a little detail on the Humda use case, but we're going to have to run through this a little bit quickly. Okay, um, so what was the point of the loans um, part of the ontology? Why did we have it? Well, we wanted to con define loans concepts, you know, in short, so the industry can have a standard way to represent information 
An important constraint is the regulatory compliance. As we all know, loans were a big part of why the economy blew up, you know, mortgages. So this is going to help track, track that better. Okay. And another key thing is um, to support, not just to throw it out there and say have at it, you know, industry, but really just to support and help the industry make use of it so that we can actually get the value we're all looking for. All right, so this is a quick run through what we actually did. So we first kind of educated, you know, the team. It's like, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Um, and then we defined the scope. Then we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, then we have, you know, the work team. We say, okay, team, we're going to get started. We discuss the scope. Um, we'd get various contributions, people who know a lot about loans. Um, they contribute their information. Um, and then we, we establish a core model. And then we kind of essentially iteratively build that out, right? So then we kind of do this cycle of scoping, you know, more scoping out, outside the core. Um, we author it, and then we send it back to the SMEs and we review it. All right, so now this next um, is kind of that review cycle. So we have that working scope. We select the key subset and model that out carefully, right? And then we use whatever tool the, the people prefer to use. There's lots of uh, tools out there to, to author in RDF and OWL. Um, and then we create the materials which can be more easily consumed by the subject matter experts. Some of them may be familiar with all, some may not, so we kind of create some pictures and spreadsheets, things that make it easier for them to consume. And then we kind of get some feedback, and then we go through a little cycle there until we settle on. And then we say, okay, when we've got that scope modeled out and we're happy with it, we just move on. We extend the scope a little bit, right? And then here's a kind of a simpler level of abstraction of the core model concepts that we saw an example of before. You know, the contract itself, the obligation to fund, to repay, the different parties, borrower, lender, this expands out a little bit from what we saw earlier. Okay? Um, so then we had to integrate the loans ontology with what already existed. So we don't want to um, start from scratch. And there was quite a lot of work done already. There's a foundations element. There's business entities, all kinds of organizations. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of ontologies, and they're kind of in a network of importing each other. And then on, on top of that, there's an area called business, finance, and commerce. So this is what existed before we came along and started building loans, right? So then what we do is we say, okay, don't invent the wheel. Let's not just create new concepts for what's already out there, but connect up what we have with what's already there. So for example, loan contract is a financial instrument, right? I'm not sure what happened here. Anyway, it's a financial instrument, which is a written contract, which is a contract. As David said earlier, everything revolves around agreements and contracts. So a credit check, that's something that happens, right? It's an occurrence. Um, universal identifiers, financial instrument identifier. And there's a more generic concept of identifier. So this is the kind of thing that we do, and that's just filling out a variety of other concepts. So, the whole process of connecting up to existing FIBOs, there's a number of things that can happen. Maybe there's a nice connection that we can just grab onto, that's good. Or maybe there's not a connection and then we have to make suggestions to the other working groups um, to say, well, here's something that's missing, let's add it in a good way and then we'll come back and we'll hook up to that, that new evolving piece, okay? Um, so now over to you to Lynn and we've got five minutes left including questions. <laughs> so. Try to go through this as quick as you can without um, losing out the essence. Lynn? Are you on mute? Hello, Lynn. Yes, I'm on mute. <laughs> so let's quiz past this slide and we'll look at why we would look at Honda. So what is Honda in any case, right? So Honda is the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. It's a rule that was promulgated by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau at the U.S. Uh, last uh, fall in its final uh, state. And it is an, a rule that basically requires um, every United States lender to report information to their regulators um, describing uh, not only key risk assessment uh, factors, but also uh, demographic information about our borrowers. Um, it is required uh, so that the, uh, the regulators and the public can assess 
um, any particular market participant's uh, ability to uh, to uh, lend in a fair and equitable way and to provide equal access to credit. So why would we look at this uh, from a hundred perspective? Could you go to the next slide, Michael? Um, one of the reasons uh, that we wanted to look at this is uh, that for one thing, the file that we used to send to the regulator is being uh, pretty much completely rewritten. And so um, lots of lenders and processors will have to retool their infrastructures um, as they look at, uh, at complying with this new rule. Uh, the actual data that is required in the new rule is significantly expanded. Um, what used to be a, a handful of data now uh, is, is, you know, uh, stretching to, uh, if you look at the very granular data, about 130 um, data points to create the report. Um, the reporting also uh, requires a lender to integrate data across different lines of business or transactional silos. So um, integration and harmonization of data it takes a focal point here in the sense that um, every lender will have to take data across their business lines and integrate it to create these reports. And then lastly, uh, the new rule adds quarterly reporting on top of the annual reporting requirement for large filers. So for large organizations like my own, uh, not only do you have to uh, be able to process more data um, across your business lines uh, in an expansion of scope, uh, transactional scope, but you have to do it four times as fast as you used to be able to do it. So if you move uh, to the next uh, slide, Michael, this is a picture of um, our use case, um, and it really is depicting uh, what I just described. You have uh, multiple lines of business um, in illustration. And then each of those, you know, creating a specific uh, data sets that, that are based upon their, their own native formats, um, passing through a 5.0 translation layer uh, to generate an integrated uh, report for the regulator. It's called a law report of loan activity uh, and loan application register uh, for the CSPB. So we have been working on this, uh, this use case for the last several months, um, among others of the amount of data that's required. Um, it has direct application for a number of the parties that are already uh, participating in our working group, and that uh, it, it showcases some of the capabilities of semantic technologies very clearly, um, you know, right from the start. So uh, we've been working on this uh, and have been working uh, in working team meetings that occur every week and look forward to anybody who likes to join uh, in participating with us. Thank you, Lynn. I will hand this back over to Michael to wrap up um, and talk about our lessons learned. Okay, so we're out of time, but I'm just gonna call attention to one thing, the last bullet point that you can directly use you know, some of the fiber ontologies as a data model. You don't need to have multiple layers. You can if you want to, but this has specifically been designed so that you can out of the box take it and create data. Um, so key takeaways, MISMO and FIBO are not two alternatives that one should, sorry, it's not one should replace the other, but both can live on and each has a role to play. Um, and I'll just leave time for a question or two. Um, and there's, I'm around afterward as well. Questions? Yes. So you, you, uh, you point out the uh, common standards that they build right now, but the, when you do the demo, the, how, how much, how many can they actually be looking at? What level people are going to have uh, out of the world? So you have a credit regulation, for example. Then you also have the, uh, the river issues that split all kinds of credit lines. Right. Okay, so the question, if I understand it, is there are a lot, the comment is there's lots of other standards out there and how many others are we going to work with? Um, that's a good question. Um, we're working with Humda right now. Uh, Lynn, I don't know, you may have a comment about that. Are you on mute? 
The so, question is, why did we focus on this law? Well, no, the question is, there are, other, there are other standards out there. Are we, how are we going to make sure that, you know, they are, can we work with other standards as well as with MISMO? I can't, I can't understand what the question is. All right, well, I will just give okay. my two cents. I think that um, as other standards come by, if people who want to use FIBO and they want to know how it interacts with the standard, you know, we can, we can work with them and try to find those connections. Okay, the question is, Mismo is pretty substantial. He's not familiar with, the, the question, they ask her the question, he's not real familiar with Mismo, but he, he acknowledges that FIBO is very large, and what problems did we have in actually mapping the two? Um, so we're not actually directly mapping the two at this point in time. Um, yeah. Lynn, do you have a comment so for the what we are, Yeah, so what we are doing, though, is letting it inform our work so given MISMO has a good amount of adoption and industry penetration, we don't want to recreate the wheel. Uh, we want to keep the lessons we've learned uh, using MISMO and its structures and let it inform uh, our work. And it's certainly not the only standard that, that we would refer to. Um, we also look at um, ISO 2022. We look at uh, other standards uh, like those related to insurance or the Accord model um, as, as, as relevant. Um, the reason that we look uh, primary, primarily at MISMO as sort of the model uh, is because a lot of our working group participants uh, cross over from both groups. And so we have a base of knowledge there that helps to um, inform what we're doing.